when I was speaking to a number of different aid workers, and, and that's as specific as, as I'm going to get on it, um, a number of them were going through this kind of cost-benefit analysis, starting to really think, given that our operations are being, over time, so <coughs> restricted by the Sudanese government, um, what are the costs and benefits of saying? And the Sudanese government, or Sudan, or Darfur more specifically, because the South is a different issue, but Darfur is, I am inclined to say, and I'd love to hear if someone's got a different opinion, but almost unique in the sense that you have a humanitarian operation and a peacekeeping operation in a country where you have both a strong central government and a government that really doesn't want you there. Most situations where we have externals deployed, you either have a host government that wants you to be there not necessarily for um, angelic reasons, sometimes it's politically beneficial for them or it just saves them the cost of doing it themselves, but that there's a host government that actually wants you there, or alternatively, you've got a failed state context. It's actually incredibly rare, and I've been trying to think through of, of comparable situations where you have this coupling of a really, really strong central government, and they don't want you there. I mean the Sudanese government would love all the internationals to just get the hell out of Darfur. Um, and the consequences of that coupling that is so rare are really being felt on the ground. And there's been the squeezing of the humanitarian space. It's a squeezing both geographically, so operations have gone from you know, deep field, being moved back to field, being moved increasingly just to around the major towns. Uh, so there's whole areas of the population that just aren't getting services. And more subtly, but almost, well, certainly as, as damaging, is the squeezing of the range of services and the extent to which the Sudanese government has been able very cleverly uh, to define what is and what is not a humanitarian service. And you know, at the, at the obvious level, there's the, the ability to expel organizations or to PNG individuals, but there's a whole host of much more subtle mechanisms, such as not renewing visas of certain aid workers or certain organizations, uh, not signing the technical agreements that the organizations need to operate in Darfur. And through all these different processes, they've been able to squeeze both geographically, but also the range of services. <coughs> um, and as I said, it, it, came, it came to a, a public head after the ICC issued an arrest warrant for President Bashir uh, on crime, war crimes and crimes against humanity in March. And the Sudanese government, it said, responded by, in actual fact, I would say that the arrest warrant was a pretext for action that they were already taking in different forms, expelling these 13 international organizations and disbanding three of them. And in the aftermath of that, you had this massive scramble uh, on the part of the UN, the AU, uh, different governments, and also the advocacy community to try to fill the gaps in humanitarian services. But the report that was done, the assessment report, focused on what the UN calls life-saving sectors. So your food, your water, your sanitation. And that's fine. I mean, in an emergency, you're going to have to triage and, and prioritize certain things. Uh, but from what I saw, the big problem is that the process got stuck after that, and there are a whole host of humanitarian services beyond those life-saving sectors that are really vital to the population um, that have been missed. And, and in essence, it means the government has been able to eliminate them. The one that I was most, that I heard most about when I went off the record, um, both with humanitarians, the UN, and the IDPs themselves, was services for women who have been raped or have faced gender-based violence. And to be sort of, to, to concretize it a little bit, it, the way it was described to me by um, a woman in one of the IDP camps, previously in her camp, uh, if 
a woman had been raped, which as we know throughout this conflict has been happening, particularly when a woman didn't go out to get firewood, leave the perimeters of the camp, um, she would be able, in this particular camp, and I won't say which one, but be, be able to go to the women's center that was at the camp. And one of the NGOs that was expelled was running it, and it was an income generating center. So people would do things like basket weaving, and, and it would give them an independent source of income, these women. But it was also a center through which um, the organization could sensitize the camp population around issues of sexual violence, HIV, AIDS, domestic violence, that meant that when an issue like this arose for one of the women in the camp, they felt like there was already a community there that was a safe place to discuss it. Um, and in addition, um, medical care could be provided within this camp, um, also psychosocial services. In the aftermath of the expulsions, that is gone. You, you literally see this empty center that used to be a women's center. And the particular medical services are gone from the camp. So what happens now if a woman is raped is that if she wants to get medical care, she's got to go to the local hospital. There is a local hospital, and I think probably the government would say, well, it's a local hospital, where you can go. Um, but there are so many obstacles that come up with that. One of them is that still a number of local doctors are requiring a police report to say that a woman has been raped. Um, so before you even get to the doctor, you have to hurdle of reporting it to the Sudanese police. Um, and there's a whole host of issues that I could go into and warrant about the Sudanese legal system and the risks for reporting rape within that system. Um, and then really just basic practical things like it costs five pounds <coughs> to get into the town. Now, if the income generation center or project that I used to have as an independent source of income is gone, now I need to go to my family. That means then I need to disclose what's happened to me to my family. The cost of doing that might seem higher than um, the benefits of getting medical treatment. So these are the, the much more um, underreported impacts that I saw of the expulsions away from the, you know, oh my God, we're going to have famine or starvation or there's not enough water. Those things, they're real, they're serious, they need to be attended to. But there's a sort of capacity <coughs> within the system to attend to them, both because the IDPs themselves feel much more comfortable about reporting shortages in these areas, but even more critical in this instance, I think, is that the organizations on the ground feel okay talking about that. WFP can go out and, and say, you know, food shortage, we need extra donations, and they don't feel like that's risking them being kicked out of the country. Whereas so consistently I was told that the people who are on working on the ground now feel that if they do GBB services, medical, psychosocial, legal, um, that they're going to be expelled. They see the expulsions as linked to um, having had comprehensive humanitarian services uh, in this kind of sphere. And the government has been, you know, President Bashir has gone on record saying that he thinks that these allegations of mass rape in Darfur are purely fabrications of political um, purposes. And so when you have the head of what is a very strong state apparatus saying that from the top, then when you have any organization who are simply doing their humanitarian job, and, and that's really important to be clear about there, providing medical care for a woman who has been raped as a humanitarian service, and yet, in the course of providing that service, they, of course, see a woman who's had this crime committed against her, which is a huge threat for a Sudanese government that is trying to deny uh, that this is even taking place. So uh, that's the sort of depressing um, update from the ground in Darfur. And um, I'm keen to, to hear questions and 